It is my pleasure to declare the opening of the final lecture by Professor Grossberg, Kenneth Aran, of Wasada Business School, the Graduate School of Commerce at Wasada University. My name is Tatsuki Negoro, Director of uh, Wasada Business School. I will be acting as a master of ceremony today. Now, let me introduce Professor Tomoaki Sakano, Dean of the Graduate School of Commerce, and have his lecture. Professor Sakano, please. Yeah, thank you for coming to the final lecture by Professor Grossberg. Uh, Professor Grossberg is retiring from Waseda this coming March. Uh, we are very sad uh, due to the vacuum created by his retirement and also to miss his valuable contributions in the future endeavors of our school. Uh, Kenneth Allen Grossberg is a professor of marketing and director of the Waseda Marketing Forum at Waseda Business School. He has been active in international business and management education for more than 40 years. Much of that time spent working in Japan and the Pacific Rim. He graduated from Hobart College, uh, Zama Kam Roda. Is this correct? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which means actually he graduated first, right? <laughs> yeah, anyway, so with honors in political science in 1966 and earned a PhD at Princeton University in politics and East Asian studies in 1977. His research was carried out at the University of Tokyo and at Harvard University, uh, where he was elected a junior fellow of the Society of Fellows in 1974. Uh, Professor Grossberg was a well-known scholar on Japanese history. Actually, I was very surprised. <laughs> Before, he became a specialist in international marketing and Asian political economy. He, was worked in, he has worked in investment banking, banking and strategic consulting in addition to the academic world. Professor Grossberg started his academic career at Harvard. But in 1980, he turned to the private sector. Uh, fluent in Japanese and Chinese, uh, he was the first investment banker at Prudential Budget Securities to work on mergers and acquisitions in the Asian market. He left uh, investment banking to establish Orient West Consultants to offer strategic consulting services to companies involved in the Japanese market. In 1985, Citibank recruited him to be vice president and chief of strategy for their consumer services group and international in the Asia Pacific region. As chief of strategy, he was responsible for managing Citibank's strategic planning process in 10 Asian countries and for creating and directing the bank's consumer banking strategy in Japan. In the late 1980s, he returned to the academic world when ESCY University invited him to develop the marketing program for their new SISIM School of Business. In 1992, uh, Dr. Grossberg was awarded a Fulbright Visiting Research Professorship to Tel Aviv University. At Tel Aviv University, he developed and managed high-tech client-oriented and client-financed consulting joint ventures with MBA programs in Japan, Japan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. He has been visiting professor at Harvard Summer Economics Program, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, the Technion Nanyang Technological University, Hebrew University, and Columbia Vision School's Fundamentals of Management Asia Program. In 2001, he was recruited by Waseda University and became the first and only non-Japanese tenured full professor at the International Management Program of Waseda University. And in 2002, he founded the Waseda Marketing Forum. He has also been co-faculty in 
ジョイントダブルディグリープログラムオブアスレユニバーシティアンドナイオンテクノロジカルユニバーシティインシンガポールアンドオーソーズ EU ファンディットワスダ ETP ジャパンプログラムフォアヤングヨーロピアンビジネスエグゼクティブズアザパートワクティビティズオブザワスダマーケティングフォーラムイン2012ヒノギレイティスタートアップネーションスタディトゥアオブイズレイリイノベーションウィッチ He is every summer. Now, Professor Grossberg is leaving Waseda.、Uh, we will miss him、uh, terribly, but、uh, we know、uh, he leaves us wanting our school to continue to thrive and grow.、Uh, Professor Grossberg, we deeply appreciate your valuable contributions and services to upgrade Waseda Business School during your tenure at Waseda. And We sincerely wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Sakano. Now, Professor Grossberg will give us a final lecture. Professor Grossberg, please. Big hand, please. Made it so that it would be impossible to attach. To take this off. <laughs> Do this. <laughs> okay. Testing. Can you hear me? Okay? Very good. Where was I? Oh, yes.、Uh, <laughs> nobody told me yet what today is. Yes, go ahead, c o n c o r d <laughs> All right, the suspense is killing you. I'll have to tell you what it is. Is Setsubun? Oh. oh, everybody. <laughs> Setsubun. You know, drive out the bad, welcome the good, drive out the old, bring in the new. And the title of today's talk, Marketing's New Solution, has to do with things that are new. So, it's a very timely,、uh, at least in terms of the, the day, to talk about this subject. And what I'm going to talk about today can be divided into four parts, basically. And now, this is the part that works. I can't click forward, but I can use the laser. First of all, I want to talk about my favorite subject, the primacy of marketing. Marketing is everything. Those of you who took my course know. Marketing is everything. So, I'll talk about that. Then I'm going to talk about the challenge of engagement. The word is used, it's overused、uh, by people in marketing. 
We need engagement with our target market, with our customers. I'm going to talk about how what is new has impacted engagement. And of course, all of this is very much involved with marketing automation, automation, um, artificial intelligence, which in, in our day and age still means creative automation. We haven't gotten to the stage yet where artificial intelligence is advanced so that no human marketers are needed anymore. Thank God we haven't gotten to that stage yet. And last but not least, I'll, I'll sum up talking about the complexity of this new solution, that it creates problems as well as solving problems. And that's sort of what I want to talk about today. And I invite you to raise your hand, ask questions, or make comments. Those of you who took my courses know I prefer interactive to just being a talking head for an hour and 15 minutes, um, or actually an hour and yeah, an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, so if you have a comment about anything on the screen or anything I've said, by all means, raise your hand. I will acknowledge you. OK, let's get started and talk about the primacy of marketing. And here, I, of course, I'm quoting one of everybody's favorite management gurus, Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker, who was not quantitatively oriented. Peter Drucker, whose degree was in what? Anybody know? What was he? Yes, Cochran. No. <laughs> but another? He was a lawyer. He was a lawyer, yes. And so, but he was so influential in the development of, of modern management thinking that, uh, you know, even today, what he says resonates. So, what he said was, marketing is so basic that it cannot be considered a separate function. It is the whole business seen from the point of view of its final result. That is, from the customer's point of view. Concern and responsibility for marketing must therefore permeate all areas of the enterprise. Now, he was way ahead of his time when he said that. Because marketing, at that time, was shunted to the side. The people in marketing were not the quants. They weren't quantitative. They were the ones who did promotion. They developed ad campaigns. You know, the touchy-feely soft stuff that didn't matter and wasn't really well compensated compared to the number crunchers and the people who were in finance and so on and so forth. Well, Peter Drucker elaborated on what he said. And here is what he added. He said, because the purpose of business is to create a customer. His focus on the customer was, at the time, revolutionary and really very, very core to the way we feel today about what makes business, what is important about business. The business enterprise has two and only two basic functions, marketing and innovation. So he's he added something to marketing. Marketing and innovation produce results. All the rest are costs. Marketing is the distinguishing, unique function of the business. So given that this was a man, plenty of empty seats on the, you know, in the loge, enjoy. Um, given that this was a man who was revered by non-marketing executives and CEOs. What he says is very important, and I tend to agree. Innovation, obviously, new products, new technologies, they sometimes emerge sui generis without any contact with the marketing function. But at some point, marketing has to play a role. So this is. This is, for me, the tatakidai, the base. This is the most important thing to keep in mind when we talk about what is new. OK, this is the very typical 
funnel that people in sales and marketing talk about. They talk about a prospect, that is to say, somebody who might be a customer in the future, being at the top of the funnel. That means that you are just beginning to make them conscious of what it is you're offering. Or they'll say you have a loyal customer at the bottom of the funnel. Now this is a little different from the traditional marketing funnel in that you see at the bottom the word advocacy. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Because traditionally, as it says, your typical sales funnel starts with making your target customer aware of your existence. And then it ends in purchase. But the ideal customer journey should end in advocacy. This is the driver for modern marketing. It's not enough when the customer buys what you're offering. You have to go beyond that. And here it introduces this term relationship marketing. Now all of these terms that are coming up, people use them as if the ideas never existed before. The ideas existed like content. We have to create content, content marketing. This is another of these catchphrases that you hear all the time as if marketing did not create content in the age before the, the phrase content marketing came to be used. So these are not new things. It's the way they're being used in the combinations and the impact of technology that makes them new. But here it says relationship marketing disciplines, such as social marketing, typically touch the customer at the top of the funnel and at the bottom of the funnel. So you have, uh, in attempts to, to, with search engine optimization, um, you try to attract people. Um, and then you try to keep them using, making them into fans of your product or service. So this is a traditional concept that has been transformed because of some of the things that are now new. And here we have another way of looking at the new marketing and sales funnel. This, of course, is the traditional funnel beginning with awareness and ending with purchase. But you see what, what is now different. Originally, the purview or the area where marketing was involved was really quite circumscribed. That also had to do with the evaluation of marketers within the corporate structure. Just develop awareness and interest in our target market and then let the sales team take over. That was the traditional view. But that's not the case anymore. Not anymore. Now, marketing has expanded its functional role within organizations to go all the way down through the funnel, all the way down. Sales comes in at the final stage of the traditional funnel. But marketing again pops back in when we want to create advocacy at the bottom, when you want to make a fan of somebody who's used your product and you want to bring them back for more. Now, some products, services, brands are more emotional than others. Starbucks, for example, is a very emotional brand. Some are less emotional, but you still can create a sense of loyalty and advocacy if you do your job well. So this applies as well to, for example, uh, Caterpillar earth moving equipment as it would to a, uh, you know, to a cappuccino. It doesn't matter what the product might be. Now David Packard, one of the founders of Hewlett Packard, 
said once, marketing is too important to be left to the marketing people. Now, there's a certain um, invidiousness, condescension in that comment, which returns us to what I originally said about the role of marketing traditionally, that marketers were thought of as, well, they're not the brightest bulbs in the room. We need them to create the campaigns, to create buzz. But basically, the real strategic decisions have to be made by people who are not marketers. And that's what is implied by what David Packard said. But what's also implied by him is this, he was obviously learning from Peter Drucker that marketing is the core. Marketing is the core. And therefore, it's too important. It's the most important function. So marketing people may not be you know, high-powered enough to handle marketing. There's a bit of a contradiction there, but you have to understand the mindset as it was perhaps 20 years ago. Okay, now, in preparing this lecture, I read very widely because I'm not in the front lines, and I wanted to see what people who are in the trenches, as we say, real marketers doing real marketing, what they feel about what is going on. And I felt if I read enough of them, I'd get the idea. Just as if we had, since today is Setsubun, let's say we had a jar of beans, of mame here. And if I asked each of you to estimate how many mame there were in the jar, the average of all your estimates would probably be closer to the real number of mame, the real number of beans, than, than if I had asked any one of you to give me your estimate. So there is something to be said for reading widely. And I tried to do that in thinking about what I would tell you today. So this was one article where they were talking about predictions for marketing leaders in 2016, fairly recent. And the first prediction, more important than all the others, was the chief marketing officer will have the seat right next to the CEO. Now, if you had said this 20 years ago, people would say you were crazy, absolutely out of your mind. But now, this is not considered beyond the realm of possibility. Why? The core CMO responsibility is still marketing, but the universe of people, products, and processes that marketing now involves expanding both physically and virtually in every direction that the digital business is moving in. So we have, I mean, I, I have read other sources where they said um, the chief marketing officer should be next to the chief technology officer or the chief marketing officer and the chief technology officer should be combined in one, the person of one executive, and things of that sort are going on now. And of course, it's because of the digital revolution. So um, this particular aspect really feeds into what we can say about marketing today. If you want to be a marketer today, First of all, you have to be numerate as well as literate. And secondly, you have a chance to be right up there next to the CEO, which wasn't the case a long time ago, except for certain types of companies where marketing was always emphasized. OK. I'm going to be done very soon, unless somebody comments or questions. I'm, I'm telling you. So here we come to the challenge of engagement. Now, first of all, laying the foundation that marketing is primary is important to understand how engagement can be carried out in the digital age. The two words I'd like to focus on, one is engagement, and the other is advocacy, which I introduced in an earlier slide. Every single piece I read without exaggeration, over the last three months, mentioned one 
or the other, or both of these terms. The implication is that it is no longer enough to have somebody be a satisfied customer. You have to constantly interact with them, create almost a marriage, so that at the end of the day, they'll become your fan. It's a tall order. And frankly, I'm not really the demographic that can evaluate it best. As I tell my students, I'm from the electromechanical age. And the target of much of this engagement and advocacy activity are the millennials. The millennials are going to be the pig and the python a few years down the road. They will be the big consumers, certainly in the consumer markets. They'll be the decision makers in the B2B markets. So much of this I find a little bizarre. But when I ask my students, do you really post comments about products and do you really get involved in that? And they said, of course we do, as if it was the most natural thing in the world. Now, how many of you out there, raise your hand, do get involved, comment, talk to your friends, whatever, on the social network about products and services? Raise your hands. Yes, and I was wrong. I'm, maybe I'm just an old fuddy-duddy. <laughs> um, by the way, as long as I'm doing my market research, let me ask another question. Uh, how many of you use the app Line? How many of you use Line? OK, very good. That's interesting. Raise your hands again. I want to see the, the general. Yeah, generally, the younger ones. Generally, OK. Uh, how many of you have a Facebook page? Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to see the ones who don't. All right, let's. How many of you don't have a Facebook page? Raise your hand. Okay, we have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. That's all. Yeah. Well, that I have friends who don't have a Facebook page, and I'm got I'm I electromechanical age me have gotten to the stage where it's really a pain that they don't have one, because then I have to send them things separately via email attachment. And I really don't want to have to do that. Um, and they say, well, my privacy, my this, my that, as if one thing. Who here thinks they still have privacy concerning their personal details? Raise your hand. Good. Oh, well, no, we, I, saw, I thought I saw somebody trying. Good, anyway. I mean, it, you're realistic. We have no privacy. We have no privacy. Assume they know everything about you. And you know, just be glad you're a nice person and you have nothing to hide. Uh, OK, back to engagement and advocacy. Now, every single minute, this is what happens on the social network. We're going to come back to this theme again of how much data is generated. How much data is generated. But obviously, I mean, over 4 million likes every minute. You know, I'm quoting an old uh, senator in the US Senate named Senator Dirksen when he talked about money and appropriations, he said, a billion here, a billion there. Before you, talk, before you know it, you're talking about real money. Well, here, a billion here, a billion there. You're talking about real large numbers. So automation, artificial intelligence, is not a luxury. It's a necessity. It's both a cause and an effect. And there are some sobering facts to keep in mind when we talk about marketing's new solution. In the past 
15 years, more than half of the companies on the Fortune 500 list have either gone bankrupt or been acquired or gone out of business or dropped out of the Fortune 500. That's more than half. There's an enormous churn going on. So what does it mean? It's tough being successful at business. We always knew that. But somehow, this figure of 52% has gone up. I'm, I match that with another comment. Every single step that you put between the customer and the actual function is friction. And today, people don't live with friction. People see friction for what it is. Again, I will show you other comments that reflect this point of view. There seems to be a growing lack of patience on the part of the customer with providers of markets and of, of products and services who do not meet their immediate actual needs. Yes, yes. I, you know, you're my shill. I'm so glad you asked that question because that was, on the other hand, you know, my Talmudic pill pull. That was, I said, made the statement, but in my mind, I was thinking, how many of you realize that this is part of the cant that the marketing profession tells itself? But the way they evaluate their service or their product satisfaction is very, very different from the way we as consumers might evaluate it. I'll give you an example from a friend of mine who is also from the electromechanical age, but actually worse than I am because she's one of those who doesn't have a Facebook page. And you know, in the United States every year you have to file an income tax return and send it into the IRS. And she doesn't like doing it online. She feels that, you know, somebody will be able to hack her account or whatever. So she wants to do it in paper and then mail it in. Well, as you know, most functions of this sort have gone paperless in the United States. So for her to have the privilege of filing a paper return, she has to go online and fill out what she said were pages of online application. It was almost like sticking a finger in her eye and saying, oh, so you want to do it in paper? Well, we'll show you. So, so you know, the, this is part of what Nick alludes to that, oh, you just fill this out. Go online, fill it out, and then the rest will be, you know, hunky-dory. But for many people who are the recipients of such a command, it is not considered good service or a good solution to the problem. And I agree, it's not. But this is what we're dealing with in terms of marketers feeling what they're providing. And this is what we're dealing with in terms of what the economic atmosphere is like. Yes. Please. These, these are all sources from outside Japan. My question is, how does all of this apply to markets in Japan, given the fact that Japanese may not be as dependent on the social media and online marketing? Oh, Ooh, I'm so glad you asked that. First of all, that's a separate lecture. Right. However, just to, you know, the, 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 you know, the short answer is, if you asked a class full of Japanese students, as I have done, how many of you are online and on Facebook, Facebook a little less, but line, they all raise their hand. They're very, very integrated into the social network. Differently, perhaps, from in the West. But certainly, on some, on some levels, they're more advanced because they use their mobile phones more than Americans still do for purchasing for things of that sort. Um, 
so, so I don't think it's irrelevant. I think that um, all of this will affect them. Then, then there's the basic question, which you haven't asked, but which I'll answer anyway, which is, do Jap Japan's companies really understand marketing? And my fundamental answer is, no, they really don't. They understand selling. They don't really understand marketing that well. Although, certainly compared to five years ago, they're much better. They're heavy, becoming heavy users of Marketo and marketing automation type of uh, software. So it's, they're not that far behind, as far behind as they were before, but they're still not there yet. Now this, you may think is irrelevant, but I think it's very relevant to everything I'm saying. This came from the Princeton Alumni Weekly, from a professor there who studies um, courting behavior among uh, couples. And I was taken by what she wrote. Today's dating culture is part of a general tendency to want to control and organize every aspect of our lives. Online, you can customize your preferences and opt for the most efficient companion. As much as possible, chance is eliminated from the equation. What we're talking about here is a zeitgeist. Why is marketing so enamored of it? Well, everyone is. Um, I, I, this article that this woman wrote, this Professor Wampole, brought me up to date about uh, dating mores in the United States these days. Uh, dating is considered, um, well, in Japan, it's considered mendoksai, and in the United States, there are similar feelings about it because when you interact with a semi-stranger, you don't know what's going to happen. And people want that control. And they want it just the way they want it. So, you know, I'm... I'm a little, uh, you know, it, it did take me aback because um, most efficient companion. I remember in the electromechanical age what it was like dating girls. I mean, it was a very inefficient process, truly. I mean, you know, everybody, you know, how many people you had to meet with to find somebody you could actually enjoy being with. And, and so this is, uh, seems to be a, a trend that dovetails nicely with what we have in the world of customers and providers of products and services. Anybody disagree with me about that? You think this is totally off the wall and has nothing to do with marketing? How many of you uh, agree with that, assuming you're in the, yeah, okay. Go ahead. I mean, if you're going to buy a product, you should already know about it. When you have your smartphone in your hand, uh, it takes a couple seconds to look at the views, but then you go to the next one, right? Right. It's great, then you might get the cost of Exactly. The and then you buy the product. That's right. So you can do that with a significant other as well. Exactly. Go to Facebook, or they might be rating at the 10 graph. I don't know what. Yeah. OK, OK. It's very funny because you may not realize this, but when I was in graduate school in 1967, there was such a thing as computer dating. It was brand new. And what you did is filled out an application and sent it in. And then, you know, a few weeks later, they'd give you a few names that you could call. But of course, it was more a scam than anything else because they didn't have enough data. You know, it was, first of all, it was what you provided, and it was very superficial. Well, we were. We've come a long way, baby, and we're well beyond that now. Okay, here, uh, Professor Sawney from Kellogg School said, we used to focus on how many people we exposed to our marketing, but now customers are asking how relevant it was. It's not enough to communicate information about product. The real opportunity now is through connecting with emotions Telling a story. This whole idea of telling the story, connecting emotionally with the target market, is a function, I think, of people interacting more with their small screen 
than they do with the person sitting opposite them in a restaurant. I think this is part of a major change in humankind. And marketing is simply reflecting that change. Do I like it? Does it matter? I mean, my opinion is irrelevant. But I think this is definitely, this whole idea of engagement, you're engaging with the target market in ways that will titillate or delight the target market. And it's, it's simply what marketers think is important. Um, they're, they're not necessarily talking about the product. And we know for a fact that many of the products where they try to create this emotion or tell a story are not very good. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I have one example that I'm curious Please. If Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. That is exactly what they're doing. In fact, uh, always the, um, the um, uh, sanitary napkins for ladies, they, do, they did a, a rather long... Um, uh, Super Bowl uh, uh, video where they were really um, focusing on uh, women as individuals. It was, um, they would tell uh, young women, run like a girl, um, throw like a girl. And then they, they, these were young women in their 20s, I guess, and 30s. Then they would take a group of girls who were maybe 12 and 10, 12, around there, or maybe 11, and ask them to throw like a girl and ask them to run like a girl. And of course, the younger girls ran and threw like boys because that extra layer of cultural taboo had not yet been imposed on them. And they, they did this remarkably because it was the Super Bowl. I mean, there was... What is the connection? Well, the connection is a lot of women watch the Super Bowl, too. And uh, it was actually very, I don't know if it won an award, but it was certainly very much praised for its relevancy and its depth. Um, so that definitely has to do with connecting with emotions, connecting with women's emotions. In this case, telling a story. Now, there, um, there's a, there is another Super Bowl famous case that uh, is more relevant to what I have to say in a little while about responding quickly, but I'll tell you the example now because then we'll get there and you'll uh, remember I mentioned it. It was that Oreo that there, how many of you remember that, I think it was last year's Super Bowl that they had a power outage and the lights went out for a certain amount of time? So anyway, uh, what, I guess it's Nabisco who owns Oreo. What Nabisco did, or maybe Nabisco is owned by somebody else by now, who knows? <laughs> In the last 30 minutes, they may have been acquired. Um, so Nabisco uh, tweeted on Twitter, you know, Oreos taste good even, even in the dark or something like that. So it was very relevant and everybody, you know, shared it and that was a very, it went viral uh, and was very successful. So engagement can lead to a vir virality of a message or a story. Now, the other thing that a lot of the marketers are talking about is how savvy the consumers are. The, con the, the, the consumers know that you're collecting data about them and they don't mind as long as you use it to provide quick or highly relevant discounts and services and products based on behaviors that they share with the brand. In other words, they're codependents, to use a term from another, from psychology. They understand you're taking data from their behavior or their preferences or the clicks they make on a screen, but they don't they say, okay, maybe this will give me better service or a better product in the long run. 
Now, the effective use of customer data on a data management platform will only become more crucial to the success or failure of marketing. This, this is true. So the whole idea is that the data should be used to induce advocacy on the part of the target market. This is not easy to do. But this is one of the goals that marketers now have. To create a situation whereby the data you have gathered from your target market can then be manipulated in such a way to make your target market happier with you as a product or service provider. Um, that's the ideal. Now, how many of you have gotten emails or tweets or text messages, depending on what you, oh, by the way, let, before I ask the question, let me ask another question. How many of you are on Twitter? Really? Wow. We have a very progressive theme here. That's amazing. And the rest of you, raise your hands if you're on Twitter. Okay. Fewer. Fewer. I'm not on Twitter. To, to me, that's ridiculous. I mean, you know, it's just ridiculous. But of course, if you're a celebrity like Professor Negoro, then it pays because you have your followers and they follow your tweets and it becomes part of the conversation you have with your support group. Uh, not support group, your fan, fan group. Um, support group is something else. <laughs> uh, in any case, this, um, this whole idea of uh, getting people to do your work for you, getting them to promote your product or service, is very much a part of what modern marketing is all about. Um, and uh, my next question, which I postponed to ask about Twitter, was how many of you have gotten what was obviously an email or a communication from a company that you could tell was based on your previous behavior on, online and you find it intrusive and annoying, the message they send? Only a few of you. I'll repeat, maybe you don't understand the question. You're getting an email from, let's say, a company that sells, uh, I don't know, um, cereal, you know, cereal, chocolate, whatever, because you bought it once or something like that. And how many of you think that's intrusive and these people are breaching your privacy by trying to contact you based on what they know about your past purchase behavior. How many of you feel it's intrusive? Okay. All right. Only a few. Sure. For me, That's right. That's right. That's right. The, the, by, by sophisticated, you mean something that really is targeted to your that's desires. That's that's right. That's right. Now, I've gotten several annoying emails of that sort from Hilton Hotels. Now, I wanted to reserve a room at a Hilton in Boston. And what did it do? It sent me only the hotels that were outside the United States. I was just in, infuriating. Um, but anyway, that's part of the game. Okay, word of mouth. Um, word of mouth is the sort of thing that a marketer tries to stimulate because good word of mouth is very, very valuable in promoting your product or your, your offering. Now here, we're looking at millennials. Those are the uh, people who were born roughly 1980 up to, you know, uh, more recently, and of course, face-to-face -face is still the favored way to convey something word of mouth. By the way, they can choose more than one answer, so there's multiple counting. But at any rate, social media comes in a close second. So even if they're not face-to-face, -face, they're sharing on social media. 
texting and email to me are the same, basically. You text, it's like sending an email. It's just shorter. Um, so social media deserve the attention that marketers give to it, give to them, media being plural. Um, and here, this was uh, based on research done at Columbia Business School. And again, this whole idea that consumers are more savvy about their data than we originally suspected. Duh. I mean, you know, why did you suspect they wouldn't be savvy about their data? They use digital devices every working, every, every minute of the day, every waking minute. Um, one of the most important factors in data sharing is how much a consumer trusts a brand. Well, this is not new either. Businesses that hope to build an effective data strategy need to invest both in building data as well as earning the trust of customers that make it, that makes it accessible. So this we, we just said, you know, that if you're going to know a lot about me and try to uh, seduce me to buying your product, then you better, you better be nice about it, you know? Bring me flowers and chocolate, you know, I mean, uh, metaphorically speaking. Um, but this chart shows that at least one third of those who were uh, in, in the study are happy to share their data. Uh, and of those who are not happy to share, there's some who are just very paranoid, and others who basically have opted out. Uh, those who are resigned may be what we in marketing call the laggards more than anything else. But in other words, customers want to share data. They want to engage. So what is customer engagement? This was a nice definition. I, I took quite a lot from uh, Laura Runham's uh, article. She's, uh, head of small and medium-sized business audience marketing at Microsoft. Um, customer engagement is the ongoing and meaningful dialogue between a business and a customer maintained through the use of customer knowledge and integrated both offline and online. And it results in the delivery of great experiences and long-term relationships. Well, we hope so. Um, An example of how it can backfire, some of you, many of you probably are aware that at Christmas time, uh, Starbucks introduced a new Christmas red cup, paper cup, which many of their fans were offended by. Do you remember this story? Anybody remember? Raise your hand. Okay, what were they offended by? Anybody, tell me. What? Well, it didn't have anything Christmas about it. It was just red. They wanted, they wanted you to keep the Santa Claus in Christmas or something like that. It was just red. So there was a lot of negative uh, tweeting and, you know, what people do. I mean, I'm, my personal opinion, oh, isn't America a wonderful place where people have to worry about such things? You know, but that's a minority opinion, I can <laughs> tell you. So... Customer engagement, this is, this is the ideal. You know, everybody's just so enthralled by what they're seeing on the little screen. And it's, you know, um, they want customers to react that way. Now here, we see a traditional um, uh, peak and trough pattern for advertising. Traditionally, if you use TV advertising, you'd have bursts. And then there'd be a, a, a lag and then another burst. And then you could help it with uh, content if you intersperse the, the ads with other things in print. And, over. and this is now the ideal. Always on content marketing. The most forward thinking marketers are focusing on consistent engagement. There's that word again and long-term brand loyalty with their consumers. An always-on content strategy tied to traditional TV ad campaigns enables marketers to maximize the reach, longevity, and impact of their media dollars. 
always on. Always on puts incredible pressure on the marketer because you have to always be generating a message. Either it's a print or an email or an ad or a video or something. And again, this is the ideal, but I'm not entirely convinced that even in the world of the future, engagement requires this constant um, communication with you. Um, I do believe that this always-on content marketing will at some point create a backlash among uh, the target market. Um, depending on the product, depending on the type of content, sometimes if they're using very expensive creative uh, videos that are entertaining, well, there the threshold is much higher for getting sick of it. But if they're just repeating messages uh, in slightly different ways, I think the public uh, may find that a little much. But this is what it's leading toward, consistent, compelling content. And um, here, uh, Ms. Daum, who's uh, at the University of Virginia, Darden School, uh, this is a quote from her, Google coined short bursts of online activity, micro moments. We all experience micro moments. Everybody in this room does. So. The brands that thrive in 2016 will be those that excel at capturing customers' attention and trust by delivering, again, the right content and the right dose at the right moment, informed by the right data. Nobody can argue with that, but, you know, to me, the difficulty is in the implementation. How do you get the right content in the right dose at the right moment, informed by the right data? Customers today seek engagement on their terms. There's that word again. I couldn't get away from that word. And, you know, how many of you seek engagement with your products? Raise your hand. You can be honest, because they say everybody does. Well, maybe we're a very unusual group in this room. <laughs> Somehow, you know, it, it's almost like... You know what this reminds me of? In the world before, well, almost before the telephone, when we all lived in small places, you know, many fewer people lived in big cities a hundred years ago. But gossip was a very, very active <coughs> practice. This, somehow to me, it seems like commercial gossip constant low-level buzz of communication, which is engagement, but it may not be desired. Okay, engagement on their terms means marketers must pull them in by offering valuable, searchable content, dynamic social media engagement, that usually means video, uh, and top-notch visuals, including video and infographics. Push out the message through tasteful, personalized communications and create opportunities to shake hands. To shake hands meaning be human. But this I read constantly. Consistent, compelling content. Um, as, a, as a marketing person, I get a lot of uh, emails in my inbox from companies that provide marketing services marketing software, and it's obvious they repackage the same message in a slightly different way, and you delete it just as quickly. Partly they do it because they want you to remember their name, okay. But after you remember their name, if you don't remember it in a positive way, what have they accomplished? So this is my critique of that particular type of practice. But this, of course, personalization is the way to go. We have the data, so let's personalize the messages for every individual customer based on their data and their preferences. This is the new path to 
to developing long-term relationships and increasing return on investment. This is Oracle. And they're right. That is the way you would you know, <laughs> increase your ROI. But it's not easy to accomplish. The whole idea being that all these people around the table would each have a personalized message from the same company or organization or uh, service provider. And then there's the Internet of Things. Now, to my students in class, I joked that someday your toaster, your smart toaster, is going to start talking to your smart car and your smart front door, and they're not even going to ask your opinion. It was supposed to be funny anyway. But the point is, that is the nightmare that um, some scientists have talked about once artificial intelligence gets so good that uh, indeed you won't need human intelligence anymore. That's, of course, we're you know, extending the timeline out. But until we get there, we're still at the level of smart toasters, uh, smart air conditioners, smart watches, and so on and so forth. And this Internet of Things is also churning out data, but it is not of a uh, Twilight Zone, X-Files, frightening sort yet. It will increase, however. These devices will become more available in our day-to-day -day lives. Marketers will then be able to tap into this detailed lifestyle data to foster loyalty by providing a personalized customer experience across all touch points. Consumers already expect brands to recognize their shopping activities and to personalize their experience through relevant messaging, products, and promotions. And the data collected by these devices will enable marketers to build a much fuller picture of customer behavior. How many of you saw the movie Minority Report? Again, not... Oh, all right, enough. You remember the scene where he goes into the Gap store and he wants to be anonymous. He's trying to hide out, but they knew who he was and the big flat screens welcomed him in the store by name. Well, that's part of it. Um, the, the Internet of Things, the, the only thing that kept the Internet of Things back was the cost of the chip. And now that the cost of the chip is going down, you will have your devices uh, becoming more and more autonomous. So, and, and of course, generating data. Um, and the data that's generated, I mean, even your refrigerator, the, the, the dream is to have the refrigerator that can uh, tell you when to get more milk. Yes, what Ronnie. Are you thinking about the legislation that might be changing? Because they store lots of data. Yes. You're talking about the European Union, obviously. That's, that's one example. Yeah. But for example, in the UK, they were not allowed to collect data from uh, uh, power meters because that would you know, aggregate that we can actually increase the trading rate. And we have to do on that. Right, right. It, it's a very important point that you raise because we really cannot tell how this data will be used except for you know, providing customers with better service, there are lots of questions that have not been resolved. Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. I don't know. I don't have a smart refrigerator. As a matter of fact, when I bought a refrigerator here some, uh, oh God, now it's quite a long time ago, but I remember the smart refrigerators, I avoided them like the plague because, uh, you know, I did, I, I just didn't want to deal with any more digital screens or enough in my life. Uh, <laughs> but in, in fact, the Internet of Things is the real revolution because the Internet of Things collects data on you, not when you click on a screen or go to a website. It, clicks, it collects data on you whether you like it to collect data or not. And as you said, that data can be used for nefarious purposes as well. So who knows where it will go. But it is another piece of the puzzle. OK, and here we have, having laid this foundation, we're now at the promise of automation. And here, uh, I, I wrote an article where I reproduced this. 
marketing today versus marketing in the very near future, focus groups are really going to stop being used. If they, you know, the, the, the market research companies that did focus groups are no longer going to do focus groups very much except for very specialized purposes because consumers in the wild can be caught and accessed and you can ask them the same questions and in fact you can get more accurate data because in a focus group there's always a one or two strong people whose opinions influence the others in the group and that is not getting at what you necessarily want to know. Mass targeting, of course, we've been doing micro-targeting now for a long time, but it says micro-targeting at scale. That means, because of big data, you can, you know, you can definitely differentiate between Rani and Hojat in terms of, you know, their preference for automobiles, clothing, whatever. Um, you couldn't do that before. Marketing used to look at templates, lookalikes. Now, because of the Internet of Things, because there's data on everything, the feel-alikes, the want-alikes, the do-alikes, we can look at behavior, we can look at emotion, as well as preferences expressed. And once upon a time, the metrics used were for a particular campaign to promote a particular product or service. Now they're we can use connected metrics which mean that you have a constant campaign. As the chart that I showed you, the constant content marketing, it's constant. There is no rest for the weary anymore. Customers don't just respond better to extremely personalized communications. They expect it. Well, we expect it, but we still don't get it. We, we're not there yet. Marketers need to segment audiences into the smallest possible groups to deliver seemingly one-on-one -on -one messages and automate their systems to deliver rapid response, behavior-driven messaging. They must automate because otherwise they can't deliver. There are just too many differentiated messages that have to be generated. They cannot do it the old way. Now, if you look at this as just a... A, a, a nice example of a type of segmentation. And you'll see this is called a highly defined niche market because it's female BMW drivers who own dogs and live in New York City. And I can tell you that that's not even fine enough compared to what is now possible. But once upon a time, this was like super highly defined. So we are, we are getting to the market of one. That is the goal. And we are intellectually there. We're just not there yet in terms of application because the artificial intelligence is not at that stage. And so the software is not there yet. But here's an example of personalization that I, I got from Marketo's um, materials to give you an idea of how marketing automation is making it easier to personalize. Now, this version, the version on the left, is geared toward those who visit the website who are not a current Marketo customer. The one on the right is for the customer, the, the current customer to try to get them to upgrade. And you see, it looks the same, but here it says free trial, upcoming events, contact us. This is for a prospect. This is for a current customer. Community, upcoming events remains the same, and login, because you're already one of our customers. Now, this is done automatically, no human intervention. It's based on the coding of the prospect or customer, and it happens instantaneously. This is the power of marketing automation. Here's another example. This is um, for two different industries. The prospect who comes from just general broadcast media, somebody who works in broadcasting, like these gentlemen in the back of the room who are so generously taking this video, and those involved in sports broadcasting. 
And what you can see is this again, the entire web experience changes dynamically in response to a visitor's industry, and it all happens automatically. Nobody has to push a button. So here you see the video they see is more is relevant. One is more news, uh, one is more sports oriented. Then there'll be a, a live feed, and they'll also be promoting conferences or meetings which are relevant to the two separate industries. The trade show is different. And this happens, again, instantaneously. And this is today. And this is the power of automation. And, it, and I can tell you that it really, it really makes a difference. As somebody who sent out emails for the marketing forum, and because of the limitations of Wasadinet portal, I had to limit each email to no more than, I think, 200 names. So I was uh, copy-pasting a lot. <laughs> and the point is that on this scale, you can't copy-paste. And because of the digital tools, this is the sort of thing that even a small company can use. You don't have to be a big operation. It's not that expensive anymore. So the key with marketing or automation, the key to delivering the seamless customer experience is what they call omni-channel marketing. That means you have to do everything at once. Take control of the customer interaction by integrating data from all the channels, the web, mobile web, social media, mobile apps, display, search, all devices, laptops, tablets, smartphones, desktops, and functional applications such as CRM and content marketing. So it's, it's a maze that companies must get through. And obviously, with so many moving parts, it's very hard to do it all effectively. A few years ago, the big thing was, well, let's make our website as attractive to see on an iPhone as it is on a laptop. We're way beyond that now, way beyond that. And all it does is it makes things that much more complicated and that much more difficult. Here again, we hear the, the siren song. Today's customers want to be catered to. They expect a personalized and tailored response within minutes or hours. If a business fails to acknowledge these sometimes lackadaisical attempts of outreach from customers, then that business risks damaging brand reputation, loss of loyalty. This is all, um, I don't want to say propaganda, but it is what the industry says to itself. We are trying to be much better, and our customers demand it. The dialogue between brands and consumers is one where consumers can simply post an inquiry or issue on social media. Now, of course, the threat is enormous. If somebody is very angry and tries to create a viral message against a product or a company, that can be very, very damaging. So they, they're concerned about this, but they haven't mastered it exactly. Now, I mentioned that small and medium-sized businesses are very much uh, in the social network. Facebook is very popular. Twitter is also popular. God only knows why. And LinkedIn. LinkedIn, well, that's a problem one, problematic one. In terms of engaging customers online, with the exception of social media, they'll send out a regular email newsletter. They'll give away free information or guides. And they'll do blogging. These three you've probably gotten. I get them all the time. And if they do it well, then you appreciate it. If they don't do it well, then eventually you simply you see their heading and you delete immediately. So this is not something to play around with. If they're going to do it, they have to be good. So the top challenges that either prevent business from engaging customers or delivering the great customer experience are, first of all, forecasting demand. This is classic. There's nothing new here. Not understanding the customer. With all that data, it's amazing how many providers still don't know what their customers really want and not being, or can't deliver it, and not being able to prioritize the best sales leads or the high value customers. 
Well, Philip Kotler, marketing guru, said digitize or die. This is true. You, it doesn't pay to be a Luddite in this market. But what does it involve? Digital disruption refers to changes enabled by digital technologies that occur at a pace and magnitude that interrupt established ways of value creation, social interaction, doing business, and more generally our thinking. They interrupt. They are disruptive in the literal sense. And because of that, um, it's not so easy to use them effectively. Marketing automation is the top tactic used by more than 60% of real-time marketers. Real-time marketers, of course, that's another of these buzzwords. It means you respond immediately. Uh, you don't wait. But, you know, they use social media. But about two-thirds also say they've leveraged big events like the Super Bowl or unanticipated breaking news at least once in the last year. However, despite their wide range of tactics, more than 40% of these real-time marketers still do not respond to timely trends, news, and events on social media regularly, and almost half do not create timely content like blog posts. So they walk, you know, they talk the talk, they don't always walk the walk, and it's very hard to do, to be on all the time. And this, of course, you might say is the culprit, Moore's Law, the fact that we have so much more capacity, digital capacity, in our hardware and software than we used to have, that um, this, although it may not go out in a straight line, it's going to continue. And of course, Eric Schmidt, Google said, now it's five and a half years ago, every two days we now create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up till 2003. So if you think of that, you realize we are living in revolutionary times. Uh, and the revolution is not over yet. So the term big data is used a lot because we have unstructured data that is generated by our increasingly digital lives. And social media, of course, generates such data. And this is just a repeat of the slide I showed earlier, over 350 million photos uploaded to Facebook every day. I feel like the ones I loaded from our final marketing forum were half of those 350 million. There's so many pictures. Um, 500 million tweets are published. This is unfathomable in terms of the volume. Now, this is the, this is the end result. Either she told us what she wants and what she is, or we found out without having to ask her. But this is the power of marketing automation, that you can capture all of this. And this being a sophisticated audience, you realize we're all in this boat. We are all like this. They know everything about us. Uh, unless, unless we simply do not interact digitally. And of course, in this audience, everybody interacts digitally. But, and here's the big but. And here I quote um, uh, two different people, uh, two different sources, because they, I agreed with them. Um, social platforms are not sales platforms. They are conversation platforms. Consumers on these platforms shun product-based messaging and crave useful, engaging, relevant content shared by people who look, act, and buy as they do. That's why you need influencers. Influencers are those who will influence the consumers because they are consumers themselves. And so the fact that consumers have conversations online before they make a purchase, um, brands intrude themselves into the dialogue by using so-called influencer marketing. This is another thing. It says the divide between digital advertising and consumer decision making continues to grow. It means just because you're sending out all of these messages in the various forms doesn't mean the consumer is buying it. So influencer marketing is a go-to marketing discipline to help marketers connect with consumers. 65% of companies now practice influence, influencer marketing, which by the way has had some bad rep because uh, some of the companies have been accused of manipulating using these. Here, 
influencer marketing automation, it's a new category of content marketing that combines influencer marketing so that you're, you're automating the process. I'm rushing ahead because my time is up. Um, we know that consumers access social media in different ways and at different degrees. And influencers actually influence differently depending on the product. So here it says only about 15% of respondents use social media when they choose, let's say, an electric company. But travel, investment, over-the-counter drugs, 40 to 50% will look to social recommendations. So each product category has its own discrete group of influencers. So there's not much overlap. So this, again, is not a panacea because it's very labor intensive for the company. And timing is important. A first time purchaser is 50% more likely to turn to social media than a repeat buyer. So the role of digital influence is expanding, but analog remains important. And I want you to keep that in mind. Uh, about half the recommendations were made offline, as it turns out, in person or by phone. Um, now, Sanjay, the head of uh, the CMO of Marketo, said digital marketing is no longer one of the things marketing does. It is the thing that marketing does. Well, maybe yes and maybe no. This is a case study that was done by Trax, five banks, TD Bank, Capital One, Citibank, Chase, and Bank of America. It said they collected social data last year trying to find out what the bank's overall approach to social entailed, how the audiences receive it, and how the strategies compare to one another. And it said the right social business management platform will inform banks of what customers are generally talking about or in particular need of, as well as how competitors are approaching the market. So social media data will inform banks how to proceed with their business strategy. In other words, no focus groups. We're using this type of data to get at uh, this type of solution. Now, Trax is a um, market, ser market services firm, uh, what they call a social business cloud empowering, uh, social business cloud, it's a social business cloud empowering enterprises to build their brand, attract new customers, serve existing ones, and connect with other key audiences in the social enabled world. There are a lot of companies like this now. They're replacing the old line market research firms and it says, thematic testing would have traditionally been conducted with a focus group before a larger ad campaign was launched. But nowadays, we use social media to test program names, themes, messaging, discounts, anything else that was traditionally serviced by a focus group. And here's an example. A frozen burrito company uh, started a social monitoring program and noticed that a lot of positive sentiment about their product was coming from Twitter. They also noticed the bulk of the chatter was happening after midnight, especially on weekends. So they realized the late night snackers were a great target community for sales promotions of products, and they adjusted their online marketing to engage with this blearily enthusiastic crowd on Twitter. Out of this engagement, they came up with a new product, the late night frozen breakfast burrito. Oof. But you know, there's a market for everything. OK, finally, the complexity of the new solution. Now here, the example I want to compare it to, uh, and this is an article by Ben Essen, who, who, whose blog was really very, uh, I mean, it really resonated with me. He says, before Einstein, we used Newton's laws of motion, his universal set of rules to account for all the motions in the universe. But Einstein asked the question, what if the data doesn't come from the planets at all, but from the space within which they exist, between the planets. He did not believe the evidence that everybody else did. He embraced the outlier, and he discovered that astronomers had been looking at things all wrong, and theory of relativity, it turned out the uncomfortable exception was the basis for the big scientific leap. And so, quoting Essen again, we're in the grips of a marketing area you might call Newtonian. We have been brought up in a data-driven culture with the expectation that everything should be explainable. But with the number of inputs steadily rising, our media schedules can become more robust, our insights more accurate, our creative concepts increasingly bulletproof. Making a decision which flies in the face of the data see, is seen as foolhardy. In other words, follow the data. That's the 
conventional wisdom today. But creativity creates data, only validates. So this is the counterposition. Um, much of the rhetoric about big data is rooted in its ability to accelerate the, the current paradigm. According to PricewaterhouseCoopers, 64% of global CMOs have changed the way they make the decisions. How have they changed? They don't make creative leaps. They believe that advances in data analysis are undermining the credibility of intuition or experience. No more do we need intuition. We have the data. The underlying assumption that big data will resolve the century-old Wanamaker problem of waste, spend, and fruitless creative gambles. What is the Wanamaker problem? Uh, Wanamaker built a large department store in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. Very famous. And now, of course, the whole idea is now we know which half is being wasted. But while data is more abundant and important than ever before, a marketing team will never be complete without people who have a deep understanding of human psychology. Having a marketing department which relies on data insights alone to make decisions is limited value because the problem of people not knowing what they truly want is a common occurrence. As Henry Ford said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And this is the message I wanted to combine the four marketing trends, marketing automation I already talked about, live streaming video, this is a new thing. Facebook is a growing as a business platform very successfully. Social media is going to lead to content fatigue if it hasn't already done so. Some of us are sick of all the emails we're beginning or all the communications. And here, no one less than the senior vice president for global marketing at Google has said the core assets that were so important in the first golden age are as important today. A great central thought, great writing, Great creativity. Back in the 60s, TV was coming on board, but all the work was in print. And the brilliance of print is that you have to have a really great thought and great writing. The bar isn't any lower today. You have to have authenticity, a great central thought. Those same skills that were needed back then are as critical today. You still have to define your audience, but it's simpler to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time with precision. There are fewer wasted impressions. It's also better for users because I'm not frustrating them with ads that aren't relevant. So she's talking about how marketing automation makes it easier to deliver the right solution once the solution is thought up creatively. And I will end with my favorite quote, and my students in my Zemi know this. It's hanging on the wall of my office. Not everything that counts can be counted. And not everything that can be counted counts. And just a, as a coda, this is an email I got based on marketing automation. This is the email you should have received. Hello, Kenneth. We were able to send you an incorrect email this morning with spectacular efficiency. And I love that. I love it. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, lecture, Professor Grossberg. Now we would like to express our sincere thanks to Professor Grossberg as we present a bouquet of flowers from the Administrative Office of Graduate School of Commerce. <laughs> now, I'd like to declare the closing of the final lecture by Professor Grossberg. Once again, please let me ask all of you to uh, give big applause to Professor Grossberg. <laughs> Thank you very much.